Greetings, everyone. I think we have a sizable crowd of 50 plus participants. If it is okay with everyone, uh, noting some participants are joining very, very early hours. So it would be good to stick to the time as much as possible. And if it is okay with everyone, we can start the proceedings. So here's wishing you a warm welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, depending on where you are. I am Rajiv Ghoshal, a Regional Senior Technical Advisor, Climate Change and Child Poverty Focal Point from Save the Children International, working out of the Singapore Regional or Asia Regional Office based in Singapore. I'll be your moderator for this webinar. And uh, we are very happy to welcome you to the webinar today. And this actually coincides with the Earth Day and early childhood uh, issue or thematic area we would like to discuss and uh, share with you today. Like I said, it is an early celebration of Earth Day happening this Saturday with the theme of invest in our planet. Now is the time to invest in early childhood development, policies and programs to promote resilience of young children, their families and communities at large. We are very excited to feature in this webinar the collective voices and insights from countries across Asia Pacific to call for the need to invest on early childhood development and climate change as a path to climate resilience and ultimately sustainable development. Now I will introduce to you a video if we can just uh, upload the video, which is a very short video that was developed by the Asia Regional Network for Early Childhood Secretariat in partnership with Save the Children and UNICEF in the Asia Pacific region. It summarizes the critical role of early childhood development in building resilience of young children and their families to address the climate crisis. Jason, can we have the video, please? Joel, sorry. Thank you. Supporting young children is a smart investment and should be placed at the forefront of the fight against climate change. Young children aged 0 to 6 are the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, but they are also the most valuable group in the fight against it. Well-financed, high-quality and equitable early childhood programs create immediate impact and ensure the long-term success of the sustainable development agenda. Investment in early childhood accelerates progress towards all 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals. Young children are more affected by the impacts of climate change and large-scale environmental degradation than any other group. Air pollution, disease, forced migration and extreme weather events like heat waves, flooding and drought affect young children directly. They create toxic stress, disrupting children's brain development, their long-term physical and mental health, and cognitive abilities. This can lead to chronic problems that will be carried by the individual, the community, and a nation throughout the life of that young child. Young children may be the most vulnerable, but they are also the most valuable. High-quality early childhood development programs support children's potential to build healthy, well-educated, socially and emotionally competent, peaceful and resilient communities throughout their lives. Policies and programs that support healthy early childhood development are therefore one of the most effective interventions for a better future. They provide a cost-effective, comprehensive, immediate and enduring path to achieving sustainable development in communities. By increasing climate knowledge in early childhood development settings and by building strong relations between policymakers and the climate science community, we can realize the full potential that early years development has in addressing the effects of climate change.
Systems and services for young children need to become more climate resilient. To make this happen, they need to be adequately funded and their value better understood both by policymakers and climate scientists. Funding for climate change mitigation and adaption must allow financing of early childhood development programs. We need to see early childhood development as a key to addressing climate change. We want your help. Learn more about how to support early childhood development as a fundamental and cost-effective tool in achieving the sustainable development goals. Help us connect policymakers, practitioners, and climate scientists. Together, we can create practices, systems, and policies that protect young children from the effects of climate change now and make their societies sustainable in the future. Early childhood development is crucial to achieving all of the sustainable development goals. Thank you so much for that. It was a wonderful video which also helped me learn so much about early childhood development, how it intersects with climate change. Something I was not too aware of, perhaps uh, one year or more, before I started working very closely with the RNEC Secretariat, UNICEF and others who work closely with RNEC. Anyways, the key objectives of this webinar are for everyone's kind attention and reference, increased visibility of early childhood development, climate country research studies in Asia Pacific. You will hear from colleagues who have worked on this across a few countries. To recognize the importance of data and research in addressing climate change. This is a very key area which needs to be uh, trashed out a bit more because there's a, there are huge gaps in data, particularly in relation to children and young people. Amplify diverse voices and solutions in the region to accelerate collective actions on early childhood development and climate change. Strengthen the need to invest on the early childhood development climate nexus as a pathway to climate resilience and sustainable development. The session overview is that we will have an agenda on uh, climate change and early childhood development over the next one hour and 40 minutes or so. Firstly, we will kick off with a brief interview, uh, overview of featured countries on early childhood development and climate, and climate change, particularly looking at the intersection between these two thematic areas. And this will include four micro research countries led by our NEC in the region. We are very honored to have with us and the support of the Honorable uh, Minister of Finance from Samoa, Molio, to share a brief keynote video on early childhood development as a pathway for climate resilience, building and sustainable development. Can we have that video, please? Yeah. Oh, my apologies. Uh, I will before that like to introduce to you our uh, chair, board of directors of Asia Pacific Regional Network on Early Childhood Development, ARNEC, Mr. Sheldon Schaefer to give some opening remarks before those videos are displayed to you. Over to you, Sheldon. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, on behalf of ARNEC, I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar, Earth Day and Early Childhood, a webinar focused on country insights into climate resilience through early childhood development across Asia and the Pacific. As we celebrate Earth Day, it is crucial to reflect on the impact of climate change on our planet and on the future of our children. Early childhood, as we know, is a critical period for development, and climate change and environmental degradation can have long lasting effects both on the health and well being of young children and ultimately on the sustainability of the planet. The Asia Pacific region, affected by an increasing frequency and intensity of typhoons and cyclones, drought and floods, and rising sea levels, is witnessing firsthand 
the harmful impacts of climate change on young children. In response, Arnick has spent the last two years working on the intersection of ECD and climate change, and has recently published a scoping study which explores the nature of this intersection. The study was done in partnership with the University of Wollongong Early Start Australia with support from partners such as Save the Children and UNICEF. As part of its advocacy for addressing the impacts of climate change and environmental degradation on young children, Arnick has also supported the conduct of micro research studies in the Philippines, Bhutan, India, and Pakistan. These studies have provided empirical evidence to support a greater focus on and the greater participation of young children in, in climate and environmental discourse and actions. The research areas of these studies include assessing community knowledge and perceptions of climate change, exploring the impacts of climate change on young children and their caregivers, identifying grassroots initiatives, evaluating the preparedness of ECD service providers, and assessing local policies for addressing children's vulnerabilities during disasters. A brief summary of the four studies plus a related initiative in Mongolia. In India, solid fuel for cooking is a major cause of air pollution. The study identified migrant families in the national capital region and assessed their willingness to adopt cleaner fuels. It also generated evidence on the costs and benefits of different cooking fuel options. The study in the Philippines examined people's experiences related to climate change, the perceptions and attitudes of local leaders, parents, and teachers, and their preparedness in responding to crises. Implications for the delivery of ECD programs and services, especially those focusing on young children's development and learning in the context of climate change, were also explored. Research in Pakistan examined the impact of climate crises on young children, caregivers, and communities, specifically during the massive flooding in the country last year. The research, research identified trends and ways to address climate and environmental crises with the objective of strengthening laws and policies to support young children and their caregivers. Bhutan's survey gauged the awareness and knowledge of children, parents, and educators on climate change and its impact. Results of the survey show that the biggest challenges relate to a lack of awareness and the absence of education about climate change. The Mongolia Initiative aims to address the challenges associated with improving indoor air quality and reducing air pollution in the country, especially in kindergartens and early childhood education settings. UNICEF Mongolia will present its plan for continuing this important intersectoral work. The future of our planets and its young children lies in our hands. Let us come together and take action towards creating a safer and more sustainable environment for young children by participating in this crucial discourse and implementing the solutions available to us. Let me now introduce the keynote speakers. Honorable Mulipola Anorosa Anemoliu is the Minister of Finance of Samoa, the first woman ever appointed to this role. She is an ardent champion of ECD and co-chairs the Pacific Regional Council for ECD, an intergovernmental council for early childhood covering 15 Pacific Island countries. In this role, she provides political leadership and guidance to the progress of ECD across the Pacific region. Joan Lombardi, among many other achievements, is the founder of Early Opportunities, an advisory services to philanthropy, both internationally and in the United States, with a focus on young children, families, and communities that support them, and is currently a visiting scholar at the Stanford Center on Early Childhood. She is an international expert in child and family policy and has worked tirelessly to promote the well being of children and families globally. So, first to the keynote from the Honorable Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Sheldon. Uh, Joe, can we have the keynote, please?
Thank you. Talopalava and warm greetings from Samoa. It is unfortunate that I am unable to join you in real time for this important webinar due to conflicting arrangements and the time difference between our regions. I am however pleased to deliver these remarks to address this gathering of like-minded individuals across the Asia-Pacific region who together raise the agenda of climate change and early childhood. Here in the Pacific region, we have been actively elevating early childhood investments as a cornerstone of resilience building, including climate resilience. Just in February this year, the Pacific Regional Council for ECD, which I co-chair, organized the 2023 Pacific Early Childhood Development Forum with the support of UNICEF and New Zealand government. This forum gathered high-level government participants from 15 Pacific Island countries, including Samoa, to discuss the advances we have made in implementing the Pacifica Call to Action on ECD, our nine-point action agenda for young children. A main outcome of this forum was a resounding commitment to invest more in early childhood development as a pathway to climate resilient communities. To formalize this commitment, we endorse the addition of action point number 10 to the Pacifica call to action. Action point number 10 beckons countries to prioritize ECD as a pathway to increase the resilience and adaptive capacity of communities to the effects of climate change and other emergencies and promotes close collaboration between the areas of ECD and natural resources, environment and sustainable development. Adding an additional point expands the aspiration of the nine point Pacific call to action on, e on ECD towards a truly sustainable development in support of our 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific continent. Altogether, it underscores the urgency of rallying stakeholders, resources, knowledge, and financing to attend to the needs of the youngest children and their families when intervention and support make the most impact. Failing to give children the best start in life perpetuate cycles of poverty and disadvantage that can span generations, undermining the strength and stability of society. On the other hand, decades of research show that policies and programs focused on ECD provide one of the most cost-effective, comprehensive, immediate and enduring path to boosting human development as well as achieving climate resilience and sustainable development. Multifaceted ECD programs across health, nutrition, early learning, safety and security and responsive caregiving offer a promising combination of intervention to build protective competencies essential for resilience. Given our vulnerability to the wide effects of climate change, action is needed now more than ever, and one of the critical aspects is ECD. We need to do more to improve research and data on ECD and climate change. We have increasing information on how climate change impacts children. But we need to do more in disaggregating that data to focus on the specific needs of young children and the developmentally appropriate intervention to best support them. We also need to do more research and documentation on local solutions to ECD and climate change that achieve short-term and long-term gains. What are some concrete packages of support that we can quickly deploy for ECD and climate change? And what are the documented impacts and benefits? We also need to build a compelling and collective narrative on ECD and climate change. For this narrative, we need to include and amplify diverse voices, 
from policy makers to service providers to parents and community. At our last specific ECD forum, children were front and center in our discussions. They told us what they loved about their Pacific homes, which motivated us as government leaders to do more to protect all faces of their Pacific homes. The youth in the Pacific are also very active on ACD and climate change, speaking loudly about what they do and what others need to do to protect their youngest brothers and sisters. The narrative we build together, we need to bring it to the global stage so that global climate discourse recognizes ECD as a cornerstone of climate action. Our narrative should lay out the case for ECD to be recognized by international processes such as the UNFCCC negotiations and the upcoming discussion about the way forward for the SDG. We also need to amplify the global call for financing facilities on climate change to recognize programs and services for ECD. This is important to small island development states because for us, every bit of investment must be used in the way that has the most extensive intersectoral and long-term impacts, ECD does this. Together, we can do more. On this Earth Day and beyond, Pacific Regional Council for ECD joins ANIC and this network of ECD and climate change champions to elevate ECD and climate change. I thank you for your motivation and passion to do more for our planet and to ensure young children have the best start in life as they become the next stewards of our planet. I trust that with our growing collective voice and action, we will move the needle, bringing more people into our fold and channeling resources and efforts towards the earliest years of life when we can make the most impact. Fafitai, thank you and best wishes to you all. Thank you, Honorable Minister of Finance, Government of Samoa, Mulipola Anarosa Ale Molio, for this wonderful keynote address and the encouragement you have given to us all. Uh, before we go to the second video, I'd like to just briefly introduce, as uh, Sheldon has already done for the most part, is uh, this is Joanne Lombardi, who's a senior early childhood development expert and has been the steer in terms of the importance of country research studies, which have happened across the Asia Pacific region to inform national and global initiatives on early childhood development and climate change. With that uh, brief introduction, I will request Jewel to and upload uh, the second video. Thank you, Rajiv, and thank you, Sheldon, and particularly thank you to the Honorable Minister for those very important remarks. Just a few weeks ago in my neighborhood, the cherry blossoms came out in all their beauty, reminding us of the gift that nature is and how important it is to protect it because by protecting the environment, we really are protecting the future for children. We're here today to celebrate, to celebrate the Asia Pacific Regional Network for Early Childhood, the national networks, the researchers, and all the partners for their pioneering work on climate and environmental issues. The work that not only focuses on the vulnerability of children to these environmental risks, but also reinforces the importance of early childhood as a pathway, the value of early childhood as a pathway to resiliency and the potential for mitigation. We know that these dual goals that had always been the traditional goals of early childhood to reduce the risk factors and increase the protective factors have been so important for us over the years to optimize development. 
So what we're here to talk about is how important it is to reduce those risk factors that are now increasing in the environment. We know that every aspect of nurturing care, the nurturing care elements that we have so come so um, to understand serve as important protective factors, good health, adequate nutrition, early learning, responsive caregiving, safety and security are all protective factors. But at the same time, every one of them are at risk because of the changes in the environment. And that's been our concern. Earth Day comes this year and we celebrate the natural environment. And we know that the natural environment, the social environment, and the built environment are all interrelated and all of them affect child and family well being. But it's not just one day a year that we should be concerned. Every day, children are facing environmental risks around the world. And children notice. They notice when it's too hot to learn. Children notice when drought affects nutrition and makes them go hungry once again. Families notice when the air is polluted. They worry. They worry about their children today, and they worry about the future their children will inherit. We have to give voice to those concerns. We have to bear witness to what children and families are going through. And I think what you're going to hear today is all about that. This is groundbreaking research that form a mosaic of the of the all of the issues that are facing young children and families. I think this research is particularly important for at least three reasons. First of all, it represents a variety of the environmental issues, both those issues that are concerning within homes and around homes, and also the changing environment that we're seeing that's bringing us natural disasters and different perceptions about the impact of the environment on young children. Secondly, the researchers are from the Global South, once again, underscoring the importance of the talent in the region and the importance of building that capacity and giving it more visibility. And third, it's timely research. This is research that's been designed and disseminated in a timely way so that it can impact change. So you're going to hear, as you've heard already, of research from the Philippines, from Bhutan, from Pakistan, from India, and a case study from Mongolia. All of these research is so important. But this is just a start. We have to stand up and do something. We have to ring the alarm bell, but also ring in a sense of hope, a sense that change is possible. And I think each of you are doing something to make sure that that happens. Um, it's important to all of us to speak out for better policies to bring nature closer into the lives of children and ground them in a strong social and emotional skills that they're gonna to need to face the changes that they're gonna see in their lifetime. We have to support families as they deal with the changing environment. We have to help communities prepare for disasters and build the capacity of our programs to also help the community prepare for those disasters. We have to partner with youth wonderful youth advocates who are showing their sense of agency and speaking out about their concern for their future and for the environment. We have to become citizen researchers and document the impacts, but more than anything, we have to put the research to work for change. You know, I spent five decades in this wonderful field of early childhood, and here are some of the things I've learned. I've learned about the joy and potential of children, the importance of caregivers, the essential role of the community. But more than anything, I really have learned that change is possible. You can make the difference. We each have to take our own step. And together, I really believe we can have a more sustainable future. Thank you and have a wonderful day.
Thank you so much, Joanne. Uh, so inspirational, so passionate, and uh, gives us a great steer for this webinar and beyond. So before we can uh, jump into the uh, presentations uh, for the countries, what we would like to do is just have a bit of a warm up for two minutes so that people can try and participate. And we have a Mentimeter, which uh, you can see two warm up questions over there. So the first one, which you would like to pin on the map is, uh, which country do you work in? If you can respond to that. And following which, yes, thank you. can see the dots emerging, lovely to see. I think it'll be great, uh, Peck uh, or Joe, if we can take a picture of this when it is completed, uh, because it really looks nice to see people from all over the world. In fact, we had someone from New York also who joined but had to leave, uh, UNICEF New York. So with that, I would go to the second one. Second question. It's a simple question. How familiar are you with this idea of early childhood development, particularly in the way it intersects with climate resilience? Options are not at all familiar and very familiar. Be very frank and honest. From my side, to be honest, one and a half years back, I really didn't know that much about the interconnections between early childhood development and climate change. But over the last one and a half years, after my association with our next secretariat, colleagues like Sarah, who are on the panel from Save the Children, UNICEF, PEC, and others, I've learned so much more. So. Please be very honest about this. So it seems uh, it is between not familiar and somewhat familiar. So the highest is 13, which says somewhat familiar, which is encouraging. And you have at par now, not familiar, which is also 13. So that's great to know. People are aware to a great extent. And it's okay if you're not very familiar with it. We are all on a very steep learning curve on this. And uh, I'm sure as we move on, we will get more things to talk about and give this space a lot more visibility in global climate change uh, policy discourse and practice. Thank you so much for that. Uh, before we get into the uh, speakers from uh, each of the countries, micro researches, which, has ha which have happened, allow me to just introduce you to the speakers before they take the space. So we have uh, Bhavreen Khandari, who is an environmentalist and a co-founder uh, of Warrior Moms in India, who's advocating for clean air for children. We have Dr. Maria Rita Lucas from the Philippines, who's a university professor and currently dean of the School of Education, Liberal Arts, Music, Social Work, 
of Centro Escolar University, Manila, Philippines. She was the team leader in the curriculum development for three and four year olds and training of teachers in the project of the Early Childhood Care and Development Council. We have Saida Maryam Shah from Pakistan, who is a manager for an education institution called Idara Italimo Agahi, ITA, that is in, in short. She has nine years of experience in early childhood development and education, where she has developed curriculum aligned syllabus, ECE workbooks, teacher uh, guides, and various training modules tailored to the local context. We also have Karma Gaelic from Bhutan works with the Ministry of Education as a program leader for early childhood development in the country since 2007. He has contributed in pioneering and bringing the program to its present state. He has also researched and published extensively on early childhood care and development in Bhutan. Last but not least, we have Uzi Saikhan Sirita, pardon my pronunciation, from Mongolia, who has been working as early childhood officer, development officer in UNICEF Mongolia for six years. She has written articles on indoor air quality in ECE services in Mongolia for Arnek and Bernard Van Leer Foundation and Capita Block. So I would request uh, the first speaker or presenter, Bhavreen Khandari from India to provide her presentation and request all speakers to stay within the time limit of eight minutes because we want to uh, be right on time in terms of the entire webinar. Uh, so I would request Bhavreen to share a presentation. Thank, Thank you, you Barbara. Uh, Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Gosal. And uh, I appreciate uh, uh, without going into details of all the uh, you know, wonderful uh, uh, introductory um, and encouraging words that we've heard. And uh, also to know that there are more people and more citizens all over the world who are joining in such an important and critical uh, uh, concept of uh, looking after the children of the world and that they need good health. Um, uh, thank you so much, Arnik, for giving us this opportunity, us as in parents and ordinary citizens. Uh, so this is uh, about, you know, um, you know a, a study that we are already campaigning for on household air pollution as um, something as, you know, quite uh, as many times we read it, but it, it contributes to about 30 to 50% of the ambient uh, air quality in India and over 40% households in India still don't have access to clean cooking fuel. So, and uh, this is uh, despite, uh, you know, a universal coverage of this uh, wonderful scheme of uh, Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana, but, uh, so the, here is a study that we, uh, as you see on this slide, uh, you know, again, it, uh, this is a global account that uh, it mentions uh, estimated 3.2 million deaths per year in 2020. Uh, you know, as I speak, I get goose pimples. I have such a bad throat and I excuse myself. And I don't think I've had a worse cough in my life like this. And my heart goes out to the children and the women who are actually, uh, the, they are the masses in our uh, uh, country. Uh, we are the elite who can still talk about ventilation. Uh, the rooms where we conducted this study are uh, even less than say six, six and six and a half feet by, uh, you know, six and a half feet. And there is absolutely no window. Uh, sometimes they don't even have doors and they just have these plastics and flex, uh, you know, uh, uh, taken away from the streets that have been put. So, uh, and then they're cooking inside that. And you can imagine that the whole family gets exposed, including the children. And sometimes the ch these are the migrant workers. So the children are, are the ones who are actually cooking in the afternoon themselves also. So they even uh, get exposed uh, more to all this. Uh, the chula, the chula, which we call uh, in India, it's the traditional cooking stove that uses uh, wood and biomass, crop waste, uh, twigs, etc. Uh, so, uh, you know, we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, the, um, uh, this this uh, 
particular scheme, the Prime Minister's uh, uh, Pradhan Mantri Ujula Yojana has uh, given over 8 crore uh, uh, household access to subsidized LPG connections. But obviously the insufficiency of this subsidy uh, combined with the difficulty of getting refills uh, that the people now, even if they have the cylinder, uh, the cost of the LPG cylinder has gone up so high that they don't, uh, they, they can't afford it and they don't buy it. And they are just those cylinders or those electric uh, stoves are lying for uh, only for, uh, you know, like a showpiece or a planter or they become a seating space. So this is uh, something that, uh, you know, we are working uh, towards and this study has helped us show we uh, conducted uh, studies on 12 households of two locations in Gurugram and, and Delhi NCR. So uh, where six households were using the clean cooking and the six were using the, uh, the uh, uh, chula, which is the uh, biomass burning. And they were very, very clearly identified that uh, the, uh, when the air, the, the air weather monitors were put in into these uh, 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 rooms and the uh, house houses and the data was coming directly and it was absolutely evident how how poisonous and toxic uh, the air was in these homes where clean cooking wasn't available and uh, uh, again the uh, the focus on women and the children because they are going to be there in the house all the time and it stays the indoor air pollution stays after the cooking so this was a very uh, critical point that we, uh, uh, critical study and the point that we brought out and it's not the first time that it's been brought out, brought out but it helps us uh, immensely in our campaign to convince the government, you know, and the authorities to, uh, uh, you know, focus and uh, advocate for and give us more, absolutely the highest subsidy possible for uh, cleaner cooking and all the cleaner cooking options. So, which of course uh, we're working together on that. So, the objective of clean cooking and then uh, you know connecting with the governments. The results are here, as you see in the graphs, are very evident. The clean cooking fuel and the chula wood stove. So, uh, the, we of course monitored the PM two point five and uh, the PM ten, and uh, the induction cooking was of course uh, much cleaner and uh, without getting into the uh, you know the uh, figures and the uh, concentration uh, units, uh, the technical units, it's much cleaner than the ones uh, we, we were using. So, and also there was a little, uh, you know, survey that we did in a questionnaire form and uh, uh, where, uh, the, uh, where they were using uh, uh, biomass, where were they burning biomass, they were visiting the hospitals much more. So, but uh, uh, th this is of course our next step for another study now com coming forward. It's a thing that we can do an elaborate uh, questionnaire on this because to save those 1100 rupees, they were spending close to about 20 to 27,000 rupees in a year, going back to the hospital again, you know, uh, hands and forth, you know, for, for the treatment of the children and themselves. So, uh, of course, uh, what we learned here was very important that women are uh, the most uh, uh, effective with the air pollution and also the children because every home had children. And uh, the local women also represent uh, a lot of knowledge and because they are the primary cooks of the, uh, and uh, they are the, or, uh, the main uh, target audiences for interventions to mitigate the household air pollution. So they are the ones who will have to be worked upon. So we look forward to actually speak to them, all these conversations that we had, the communication that we did uh, along the uh, you know, study uh, became a very important uh, connect and uh, kind of they were grasping it very well. And this needs to be like, uh, for us, it's, a, it's an eye opener and we want to take it up in a much more uh, uh, organized fashion. And our aims was to explore their uh, lived experiences and perceptions of the health effects of household air pollution through air quality monitoring. And that we did with the, all the uh, air quality monitors that we put in. And now, of course, we've illustrated uh, uh, the results. And uh, uh, we will now, after today, the study, when it's released, we will go back to them and also show them this and speak to them and how, uh, you know, that we and the global level are talking about it. So just gives them more confidence on whether you know how they, they'll become our messengers to further people 
and the study indicates higher pollutant levels during cooking, especially in houses uh, using chula. And uh, high PM levels were reported, high exposure for women, young children, and elderly, which uh, can only be minimized by alternatives such as uh, clean fuels and kitchen ventilation. And like I said, ventilation is, uh, is quite an uh, elite uh, uh, concept because we can do all that here in our big homes. And I think that their homes were absolutely, uh, you know, like a box. And uh, uh, so it's important that they, uh, the clean cooking reaches them uh, immediately. And I once again want to thank uh, Arnik and uh, uh, Early Childhood for giving us this great opportunity and helping us take our uh, steps forward to bring in clean cooking fuel for our, for, you know, our more moms and parents and households. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, it was a wonderful presentation, particularly noting that clean cooking is becoming a major intervention area to work on in climate change and environment space. In fact, a lot of organizations uh, are dealing with this issue and uh, seeing a lot of uh, good effects in certain cases. In other cases where there are evidences, but uh, these are quite mixed in terms of uh, the impacts which are accrued at the grassroots uh, by families because of uh, you know a very very weak monitoring systems and follow up uh, and uh, operations and maintenance uh, aspects. Uh, without further ado, I would uh, request to move on to the second uh, presentation by Dr. Maria Rita Lucas and. Uh, Please stick to eight minutes if you can, ma'am, uh, and focus mainly on the purpose and scope of the study and its key findings, including, of course, lessons learned and, and uh, the key features. Thank you. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Rajib. Good day, everyone. This micro research was conducted in collaboration with the teams from the Early Childhood Care and Development Council and Centro Escolar University. Next slide, please, Joel. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, the study was conducted in Articha in Eastern Samar in the Visayas, which is perennially in the path of typhoons. In contrast, Nabuntaran had experienced calamities more recently when Mindanao began to be in the path of typhoons, which decades ago would have been very rare. Purposely, barangays, which mostly experienced the effect of calamities, were included in the study. A total of six barangays, each from Nabuntaran and Ar Artiche, with a total of 45 respondents of local leaders, child development teachers, and parents in the study. Next slide, please. So our objectives is to determine the level of awareness of parents, teachers, and local leaders about climate change, determine their attitudes, determine impact of climate change, and their actions to their lived experiences, determine local leaders' readiness to respond, and finally draw implications for ECCD program delivery. Next slide. Our research was both quantitative and qualitative. We use questionnaires, observation, document analysis, and focus group discussions. Next slide, please. For the key findings, most believe that climate change is brought about by human activities. All respondents agree that climate change is happening and express concern about its effects and how it brings risks to our country. Majority reported needing more information about climate change and most of them rely on TV and radio for this. Majority consider scientists and experts as credible sources of information, but none of them chose teachers as trusted sources of information. Next slide. For the impact and action, all respondents reported that they had experienced the effect of climate change. In Abunturan, they noticed changes in the climate and weather. They had rainy and dry season in the past, but lately, the weather has been very unpredictable and any month can be a rainy month. 
the respondents agreed that Typhon Pablo in 2012 was a clear sign of climate change for them. It was a traumatic experience because it was sudden and such powerful and devastating typhoon was new to them. Many did not take the warning seriously and even joked belittling the effect of typhoons. A parent from RTJ Summer shared that when it rains, her child panics and hides, thinking a strong typhoon is coming. One teacher shared that it has become warmer even early in the morning, that the children preferred not to go for outdoor play, and even indoors, children did not participate in activities and just wanted to go home. One shared about not having emotional readiness when calamity struck saying no amount of food or relief goods can allay the fear and anxiety, especially when they are witness to people who lose their lives. For the actions taken, this included improving the drainage system of the town, tree planting activities, and lessening, even lessening the use of appliances. Local leaders involved both the teachers and the parents. They conducted information drive, first aid training, preparation of a family for disaster, the having the family disaster plan, which involves preparing a go bag containing essentials. Families fortified their houses and stay updated with the news and keenly monitored if they needed to evacuate. Teachers help in the sorting and packaging of food and other necessities for victims. They also conducted activities in the evacuation area, such as storytelling for our young children. While all respondents agree that schools should prioritize teaching about climate change, half of them believe that schools are not doing enough about climate change. Respondents emphasize that parents should be educated more about climate change so that they too can teach their children. Next slide, please. For the local government's readiness, the Philippines has a National Climate Action Plan with seven priorities. Our study focused on two priorities, first on human security. Here, the LGUs or the local government units focus on integrated and disaster risk assessment, the results of which are the basis for activities such as the need for housing relocation. However, relocation poses challenges such as resistance from the families and also acquiring relocation sites. The second priority on knowledge and capability building, the LGUs work on information dissemination, helping ensure that the community is informed about impending typhoons or other emergencies. The con they conduct community education, public awareness through barangay assemblies, purok meetings, and other barangay sessions. They translate technical terms into local language when, do, when they do climate change education. They share strategies with the community like waste segregation and preparing the family disaster plans. In terms of the child development workers and teachers, they're expected to be the first responders. They are part of the barangay organized committee, which is prepared once emergencies or calamities strike. They are expected to go to the affected area and participate in assessing the situation. They help in packing the needing, needed supplies for the areas. And in addition, they help in the evacuation areas. 83% of the teachers believe that they must teach children about climate change. However, 27% are confident that they have enough knowledge and skills to do it well. 72% expressed that they need more content knowledge and they reported that they lack the resources and need to learn effective instructional strategies for climate change uh, education. Next slide, please. Sifting through the finding, these are the areas significant for deriving implications for ECCD program delivery. So we see the need for the teachers regarding content and pedagogy, and um, helping uh, with the children with trauma and all of it. So they are summarized there. N next slide, please. Looking into the implications, first, climate change education for early childhood must begin with developing uh, with a love for nature. Second, the ECCD Council training manual for emergencies. This already exists. And the DSWD Comprehensive Emergency Program for Children need wider dissemination and use because this has been rolled out last year and it needs wider dissemination. Need to develop contextualized climate change education materials, have a curated list of available free materials that everyone can use. Maybe ARNIC can be the clearinghouse and the different countries can contribute to the curated list. 
develop ECCD modules for training on climate change for uh, teachers and uh, child development workers, design lesson guides on the climate change because there's an existing national early learning curriculum already, integrate climate change modules on the CBPAB. This is the emergency alternative um, kind of learning when there are calamities. Conduct stress debriefing training for child development workers and child development teachers. For their part, the ECCD Council reiterates its commitment on the following, very similar to the implications, training of trainers in ECCD and emergencies, development of materials, advocacy program to their regular kwentuhang bulilit, inclusion of climate change resilience in the ECCD parent education program, inclusion of climate change in Barangay Summit and Early Educators Congress, and for teachers to integrate emergency preparedness in the school curriculum. For their part, the local government um, officers dealing with disaster risk reduction management also provides training to the community. So these are the things that uh, we promise to focus on and work on. But as Joan Lombardi emphasized, let us reduce risk factors and increase protective factors. Ring the alarm bell. There is so much we can do, so much we need to do to make young children and their families climate change resistant. Together we say we can and we will. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a wonderful presentation. We'll uh, go straight to the third one, after which we'll break for a bit and uh, seek some inputs from the audience or participants. Uh, just to give everyone an opportunity to interact with each other. Our third presenter is uh, Saida from Pakistan. Over to you, Saida, for your presentation, please. Hello, thank you, Reji, for the introduction. And hello, everyone who is attending this webinar. I really feel positive, and we must acknowledge ARNEC and all the organizations from different countries who are part of this webinar. Today, as we are also celebrating Earth Day, I believe we are on the right platform to educate and bring focus towards ECD in climate crisis. Uh, with the same theme, I will be sharing the scoping study conducted in the flood hit region of Pakistan to highlight the impact of climate crisis on young children and their caregivers. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so first I would like to briefly walk you through to, uh, to the country context, um, as most of you must have heard about the last year's devastating monsoon blood in, uh, flood in Pakistan. It resulted into massive destructions, leading to loss of lives, livelihood, and displacement in the country. Um, according to the UNICEF 2021 well-known report titled as, um, titled as a uh, Climate Crisis as a Child Right Crisis, Pakistan was already ranked 14 on a Children's Climate Risk Index, which also also makes ECD in Pakistan more at risk. Mm -hmm. Um, in August 2022, Pakistan declared national emergency as flood affected 84 districts nationwide, uh, which included 32 uh, from Balochistan province and 23 from Sindh province uh, with most reported damage. Uh, this is an alarming impact of climate crisis as Sindh endured 8.3 times and Balochistan endured um, 6.9 times their respective average rainfall. However, in the previous year of 2021, just a year before this massive flooding, both of these provinces faced moderate to severe drought conditions, heat waves, and harsh uh, weather conditions. Um, next slide, please. Um, So it is important to understand that the overall climate crisis situation in Pakistan and countries with similar context have an urgency to address it and prioritize ECT in the policies. Uh, for, this per for this purpose, a rapid survey was conducted by IT in collaboration with ARNEC in six villages of flood uh, flooded district of Shikarpur, uh, present in Sindh. Pakistan. Total uh, 58 household participants were part of the study, as you can see in figure one, from the rural setting. Um, we used mixed methodology, which is illustrated in figure two, to gather the data, including household survey with caregivers, uh, precisely mothers, as they are most uh, uh, spend most time with the children. 
And a further focus group discussions were also held with the local government officials with the purpose to triangulate the uh, key findings on the three main questions, which included um, A, to understand the caregiver's perspective, uh, perspective of uh, climate change, uh, B, climate change and its impact on mothers and caregivers and on their babies, uh, three, uh, climate change and actions to mitigate its impact. Um, in this webinar, we have already spoken a lot on how ECD is a critical stage of human development. In infants from uh, birth till age eight specifically need healthy experiences throughout this period. Uh, but the frequency of emergencies and the impact of climate change uh, in the last five years, such as COVID-19 pandemic, um, heat waves, droughts, and this recent flooding in Pakistan has exposed the most vulnerable population to very uncertain living situations. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so to highlight the key findings, the data reflects interesting results on the climate change on ECD. Uh, we see three major themes from the research findings. Um, first, if we look at figure three, we see that the understanding of climate change is present among the 57% of the population. Uh, this is evident as they are experiencing the change in weather patterns and are directly impacted by it. So we can understand that they know that the weather is changing and the calamities around them are more frequent now. But however, when we further explore the perception of climate change and weather, the second finding reflected that there is an absence of link of human actions uh, with the cause of climate change. They cannot actually relate how um, human activities are leading to the climate crisis. It was also evident from one of the focus group discussion where one of the government officials quoted that um, after flood due to the shortage of wood as a fuel, females are making use of plastic and uh, whatever rubble is available to prepare food, which causes even extreme smoke and smell, but they are still not aware of their effect and they are not uh, known to the cause they are, the damage they are causing. Um, the study third finding highlighted the direct impact of climate crisis on ECD and how vulnerable the criti uh, and critical the need is. Um, I will be explaining you more of this in the next slide. So when we look deeper into the into the implications of climate change uh, from ECD perspective, precisely how infants, young children and mother are affected in the emergencies, we see that the mothers don't really understand their own needs and the needs of their babies even. Next slide, please. Um, so when we, uh, so when mothers were asked about the concerns toward their young ones, the top two major concerns of the mother regarding their children's needs were about their health, like uh, exposure to diseases, harsh weather, and the loss of shelter, with 40% responses, uh, which is in figure four. And 26 among the population showed concerns about their children's food security and poor nutrition. Um, however, the social and emotional needs were shared as least concerned one with only 17%. Um, this is alarming as the data highlights that the basic needs of the children are not fulfilled under the poor living condition. And this is also understandable as um, in hierarchy of needs, if the basic needs are not fulfilled, how the caregivers will understand or address children's social emotional needs, which includes uh, like right to play, uh, safety and nurturing environment and even um, early learning. All this clearly becomes very unknown uh, and secondary to the mothers. Um, if you see figure five, we see the similar findings and concerns shared by the mothers. And unfortunately, play and education was again categorized very low in reserves. This highlights that the mother are not aware of how to connect and bond with their babies in a very um, gentle and very nice way. The third and uh, the third and another finding from the focus group and the data reflects the, that the pressure of workload on mother is also very high. Uh, the attention of mothers toward their babies and infants is mainly providing basic needs of uh, their children, such as like preparing and serving food, uh, doing laundry, cleaning, and other routine tasks. The mothers are hardly engaged in the activities where they play and connect with their children to develop a nurturing uh, relationship through stories and playtime or any bonding activity between mother and child. It's not really present um, or known to the mothers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, so to quickly conclude our part uh, from the data finding, we can see that there is a need to ensure preparedness at local level, with, which must cascade from the system level. The ECD is often a neglected area in preparedness towards emergencies and is not uh, addressed as an immediate need. 
and for preparedness we must uh, we have listed uh, the few of the following recommendations which appear to be a good result oriented one for any country going through the same crisis uh, so the first recommendation is that the advocacy of ECD in emergency is instantly needed, where government and all the stakeholders are equally involved to address and prioritize ECD as a whole. Uh, two, we must include ECD in uh, the local policies of DRR and DRRM uh, to prepare in emergencies and focus on ECD. Three, uh, investing in community-based education campaigns can be very good. This can be achieved by civil societies already working with the local governments and those who have the presence in the rural areas. Um, four, we must increase parental engagement through holistic ECD programs and educate mothers and caregivers on ECD, like through nurturing care framework and um, through educating mothers. Uh, I think we cannot really uh, improve ECD through any short-term projects. Uh, so the mother, education of mothers or the direct caregiver is really, really important. Uh, five, the ownership of ECD by the departments and like uh, Ministry of Climate Change will help in development of ECD policies and and uh, strong government action plans. Um, so this is um, the brief overview of the scoping study. And uh, I think soon it will be available for everyone to read through ARNIC and ITA platform as well. Um, thank you everyone. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so, so much, uh, Saida. Um, it was a wonderful uh, presentation. And your presentation and uh, one that was uh, provided by Philippines reminded me of one particular topic which is doing the rounds these days and I'm just stretching it beyond uh, just disaster risk reduction issues because noting uh, Pakistan and Philippines are very high risk uh, uh, countries. Uh, what I'm thinking is what came to my mind, and I'll be very brief on over here, is to try and see if Arnik and its partners could uh, do a bit on uh, looking at loss and damage considerations. Because what we are actually looking at is violation of rights of uh, children and other equally excluded groups. And that calls for compensation, litigation, and other things which have really been missed out on in any climate change uh, discourse and practice. So I leave it at that for now. I mean, there's something which uh, we can all take up together as a policy piece going forward. Uh, because Save the Children has been very involved uh, off late uh, with a uh, lot of parallel consultations happening on loss and damage. And uh, we have also involved our partners, youth-led, uh, uh, LGBTQI-led, and indigenous peoples-led, uh, child rights-led organizations and partners we work with on these consultations on loss and damage. Thank you very much. Um, what we'll do is we'll just have a very quick warm-up, another one, uh, Mentimeter, where you can scan the QR code or look at the question in the chat. There are two questions which are available. So if I can request your indulgence to these questions and see what we get as a response before we move on to a brief question and answer session. Just, just to keep us all you know, occupied and active during the session. So what stood out to you most from the country sharing so far? Climate fear. Any other responses? Awareness of parents, involvement, not enough knowledge. We see that and we hear that.
child health concerns. That is very critical. I heard that too in my presentation, in the presentation, sorry. Most particularly uh, issues related to behavioral, mental health related issues, well-being. All right, I think the most important one or one something which strikes out most is awareness of parents. And the others, of course, can be summarized and relate to most of whatever you all already have studied or looking at through these micro researches, which have been uh, undertaken in these five countries. So shall we move on to the second question, Peck, please? Who are the key change makers we should work with uh, at the intersection of early childhood development and climate change? What key actions shall should we prioritize? Just very brief responses would suffice. Can we see the answers, please? Or you can type in chat if you want. Peck, if you can just display the answers on the screen, if uh, we can see it for everyone to have a look if that is possible. I think I saw nine uh, responses. So we have collaboration amongst concerned stakeholders, ECD practitioners, parents, community awareness and ownership. Introducing environmental edu education, I would think, or ECD, starting at the primary level, working with different organizations as a team, so on and so forth. Policy shifts, empowering parents, engaging with parents and frontline workers, daycare and early childhood teachers, advocacy, in involving, I would assume, involving local government units and so on. So we've had 25 answers and I think what we will do is we'll collate these and, and share with everyone once uh, the webinar uh, uh, report comes out. Thank you so much. What we will do now is to save time and move forward is uh, go into a five minute question and answer session so that we all can be engaged. Uh, there is one question which came for came for Bhavreen. Bhavreen, if you can respond to this, is what was the me methodology that was employed for the sample selection? If you have an answer to that, that will be wonderful for your study in uh, Delhi. Bhavri? I think we might have lost her. Rajiv, maybe we can go to the next question. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, the other question, uh, if someone can pick this up, any of the presenters, uh, that would be great to either uh, Maria from Pakistan or, uh, or, or sorry, Saida from Pakistan or Dr. Maria. Uh, what do you think about this conception of climate fear or fear of you know climate change happening? And can you link with any socio-emotional learning uh, factors or other concerns which you see in children members, or caretakers and gatekeepers? Is there a way of addressing this? Because there's always this doomsday type of uh, an effect we have in our minds uh, as we talk about climate change. Maria or Saeed, yes. anyone? Yes, Rajiv, uh, can I say something? Yes. Please. Um, from, from our study, we, we saw that the children, initially the children were like playing when it's raining. You know, they didn't really show any fear. They would say even the toddlers would jump on the puddle. But when they experienced the, the typhoon that really, you know, they saw bodies uh, afloat in the flood. It, is, it became so real to the children. So th there's really the trauma. That's why we said uh, training for stress debriefing is very important for child development workers and teachers. So this became a surprise because when we did the, the focus group discussion, a lot of them had jokes about typhoon, especially in Nabunturan, which did not experience this decades ago. They were just laughing about typhoons because they never experienced it. But now that it's become so real to them, there is really that need for, for uh, focus on social emotional learning so that the children can be protected before they experience and probably they would experience it in the future. Thank you, Maria, Dr. Maria. I would, for the sake of time, as we, as we are running behind time, uh, what we'll do now is uh, we'll move on to uh, our colleague from Bhutan for his present uh, presentation. Karma, uh, over to you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Rajiv. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to those in the U.S. and around the world. Good evening to other parts of the uh, people in other parts of the world. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and uh, to the organizers and thank you to the uh, participants for uh, taking interest in what we have done in a small way. So, uh, Bhutan generally is popularly known as a carbon negative country. We have 70, more than 70% of land under forest cover. And uh, we also, have a sound uh, policy on environment conservation. So to the outside world in that sense, uh, we might seem like a city on the hill and that everything must be well. But uh, when you look, uh, actually look into uh, the different sections and parts of the country, we have our own challenges and we are also touched uh, by climate change and its uh, impact. So therefore, uh, I think it's important that uh, because there is imminent threat of uh, climate change for everyone, including children, uh, we prepare to address and face uh, these challenges. So the first step in uh, preparing for uh, the such challenges in terms of people's knowledge, skills, and attitudes uh, is to get a sense of uh, how prepared people are and what they know about what aspect of climate change is affecting them and how it is affecting them or, or when and where. So, uh, so basically it boils down to the knowledge and awareness of people. So, uh, so in this uh, context, uh, I undertook the uh, perception survey as uh, a small window to look at uh, the level of understanding of uh, climate change as a phenomena, uh, its, uh, its causes, uh, actions, and impacts. Uh, uh, 
in two districts of Bhutan. Uh, the perception, of course, uh, survey was uh, a, a small one, including uh, involving 200, about 271 participants, including uh, children, parents, and, and educators, uh, uh, done through focus group discussions and interviews with these uh, respondents. So uh, what this study found out was that the awareness level was very low, even in spite of the fact that we are one country that uh, uh, puts heavy focus on climate change. Uh, we seem to have uh, forgotten the, uh, the uh, education and uh, preparedness of people to uh, address climate change and uh, build resilience in if and when uh, climate change related disasters and risk arise. Uh, as, as you can uh, see the findings, this is the, uh, the bottom line is not many children, of course, 2% of the children interviewed or uh, I inter interacted with in the course of this study were aware of climate change. 55% of educators, which is also by our standards, very poor and even less uh, number of, sorry, 55, 10% uh, of parents uh, were aware. So uh, this is uh, alarming. Uh, this finding is alarming. Of course, within these findings, we looked at uh, different aspects, as I said, uh, of uh, climate awareness in terms of uh, the causes, the day-to-day -day actions that uh, pertains to uh, or contributes to climate change, uh, the uh, impacts on uh, different aspects of life and living within Bhutan in different communities, and also, uh, more importantly, on, on children. Next, please. When you uh, challenges in the country, country when you look at uh, the different aspects of our life within this fragile Himalayan system. Most of our survival and the ability to thrive in these harsh, harsh conditions is dependent on uh, natural resources and the environment. Uh, for example, if we face a, a challenge related to climate, uh, our daily survival, means of survival, which is uh, subsistence agriculture is directly affected. The water uh, resources uh, that we are dependent on uh, and uh, which is also a source of our economy uh, is affected because of uh, reduced rainfall, drying up of water resources, and this also in turn uh, affects uh, the forests and biodiversity. Uh, in general, Bhutan is known to be one of the 10 uh, biodiversity hotspots uh, of the world. But uh, in, uh, in the face of climate change, we are increasingly being uh, challenged uh, in our uh, ability to, to maintain this status. Uh, then of course, natural disasters are unpredictable. As in the past, we have had many natural disasters such as uh, earthquakes, floods, uh, forest fires, and all of these are, are, are devastating uh, if we uh, ever come across these. And ultimately, uh, health and uh, well-being are compromised uh, or affected uh, because of all of these uh, disasters. So uh, most importantly, the health and uh, well-being of uh, children. So. When you look at all of these, uh, what affects uh, us as, as a society affects us at, at a micro level as families and as individuals, more so as, as ch young children who are dependent on adults uh, uh, for their care and ability to thrive and develop to their full, full potential. So therefore, when uh, we, have, we are faced with imminent challenges across these different areas, the, large, the biggest challenge for us is the lack of awareness of climate change as a phenomenon, of the risks associated with uh, climate change, and 
how each one of us as individuals and collectively as uh, communities prepare so that we are ready to uh, for uh, disasters uh, and we are resilient uh, to the impact of uh, climate change so so the, the biggest challenge uh, uh, when you look at the uh, findings of the uh, survey is the lack of awareness next please so uh, so this study also gives us uh, some alert uh, or a red, red flag as to what we need to be uh, doing or what we need to be aware of so so basically even though the government as a uh, as a country focuses on climate change uh, in terms of preserving forests and water resources uh, awareness of people is key to uh, addressing uh, climate uh, change and risk associated with it so therefore there has to be we recognize or realize that there has to be a stronger focus on uh, awareness of uh, people across all uh, walks of life another uh, important uh, lesson that we have learned is that we have not integrated uh, climate change in our education and uh, training curriculum so therefore this is also a lesson that we are not too late in, in doing it uh, uh, because we have not uh, so far i mean we are still in the process of getting worse so even as it uh, worse our situation worsens if we intervene uh, through education uh, in a sustainable sustainable manner it would still contribute to uh, reducing uh, the impact of climate change and of course uh, climate change mitigation uh, impact, impact mitigation uh, takes policies and programs we have policies related to forest conservation but uh, this does not uh, reflect uh, children and education so therefore it is also uh, now time for us to uh, incorporate these important aspects of policies and programs to address the challenges related to families and children. And of course, it is not enough that one sector or a few individuals uh, lead and address this. There is no possibility for any one section or uh, individual within a society to, to do that. So therefore, we recognize that it takes collective as well as individual action across society to address uh, climate change and its risks next please so uh, so based on the uh, findings of the study uh, we uh, we see a range of things that we need to do quite urgently first of all strengthening uh, advocacy and education for all including children instituting and promoting climate action groups and networks to forge collaboration and partnerships for education and advocacy related to uh, climate change and also integrating climate change in the curricula across all levels of schools beginning in the early childhood uh, uh, development uh, uh, program climate change impact uh, mitigation measures and financing should hereafter include children uh, and so that uh, preparedness and resilience is, is developed. And of course, uh, based on this small study, uh, we see that there is a need to do more studies and more extensive studies, particularly in terms of practice programs and policies uh, to see, to really uh, review and identify uh, gaps uh, within policies and practices uh, related to climate change and if uh, these policies uh, address uh, needs and uh, vulnerabilities of uh, children and families uh, and of course uh, above all legislation needs to be uh, strengthened uh, through a, a country-wide society-wide approach so so basically uh, these findings are uh, critical to uh, addressing not only addressing 
climate change uh, and its impact in the future for our children, but also in taking measures and steps to uh, address, beginning with uh, awareness and education and uh, preparing ourselves as a society uh, so that our children uh, in future have a better, have better resilience and uh, are more equipped to address, face and address challenges related to uh, climate change. So with this, uh, I end my presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Karmaji. And uh, that was a great insight from uh, uh, one of our, uh, in the subcontinent, Bhutan, one of the countries there, particularly in relation to how children in that country which is doing wonderful work on climate change, are uh, still suffering from few other challenges in relation to the environment. Without uh, uh, saying too much more on that, uh, we would like to move on to Ulzi from Mongolia, please. And if I can request you to keep it within the time limit, uh, of eight minutes because we are actually running short of time and we need to move on to our open con uh, conversation uh, session after, after your presentation. Thank you, Uzi. Over to you. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, I want to present uh, right away. Yeah. So the content uh, of my presentation is uh, briefly about uh, what we are uh, doing in Mongolia for improving the air qualities in kindergartens and what are the challenges and lessons learned and how UNICEF Mongolia is working in the future. Yeah. So about uh, Mongolia, uh, briefly, the weather is very harsh and the cold season is very long and in, the, in winter we ha have like uh, minus 20 degrees in average in a day. Uh, that's why uh, many families use coal and it produces uh, very much air pollution like you see in the photo. And uh, many people, households live in this uh, gear traditional accommodation and uh, uh, use uh, coal which is producing a lot of air pollution, especially in winter time. And it has a, a much negative impact in maternal and child health. And the children tend to have a lot of uh, flu and flu-like disease in the winter time. Uh, so uh, UNICEF Mongolia is doing some uh, innovations uh, in households, like uh, uh, in India in case we uh, heard, uh, UNICEF is also piloting some electronic uh, heating and cooking uh, products in these gears and offering a uh, green loan to households, but they, it's kind of uh, uh, also slow to scale up. Next person, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so what we have done in the kindergartens is we installed this uh, mechanic uh, uh, ventilation system in existing kindergartens and in new kindergartens. Um, also, we have a lot of gear kindergartens um, attached to buildings. Uh, so we are using making this uh, mechanical air ventilation and to enable children to have uh, cleaner air uh, during the day because children stay a uh, whole day from morning to evening in um, kindergartens in Mongolia. Uh, so we also installed a, a small uh, monitoring, air monitoring tools in kindergartens and uh, uh, trained teachers and uh, kindergarten staff have to use those uh, um, devices to monitor indoor air quality and how to make sure that air is clean during the day. Uh, also, we had uh, pre-service training in collaboration with the School of Early Childhood Education under the Mongolian State University of Education. And 
um, train in the future uh, students, uh, future kindergarten teachers about um, climate change, air pollution, and how to improve indoor air quality. So uh, uh, we also built uh, this uh, kind of new kindergartens to uh, show the model of uh, child-friendly kindergartens. In Mongolia, the challenge is uh, the scaling of these interventions is costly, uh, it has implications, but what we succeeded is uh, uh, revising the code and norms of new construction of kindergartens to have this mechanic air ventilation. So uh, it's important that uh, new kindergartens will have this uh, ventilation system. And air pollution is not re reducing. Um, although there is a, a particular regulation that uh, uh, households should use a refined code in Ulaanbaatar city, uh, still the quality is not good. And uh, um, we can see like a, a PM 2.5 is reduced, but uh, there are some other chemicals uh, still there that has negative impacts for our health and ch for children's health. So the main uh, lessons learned, uh, high level advocacy is important and we are, uh, UNICEF Mongolia is working on this, uh, especially like some parliament members uh, come to our uh, kindergartens and see how uh, children are uh, having the cleaner air. So uh, they, we are partnering with the parliament members uh, to advocate uh, for the decision makers. And also uh, we had this program with the youth uh, to have mini parliament sessions on climate change and uh, reducing air pollution and improving the indoor air quality. Yeah, it's ongoing uh, works. Next, please. And uh, how UNICEF Mongolia is planning to uh, continue its work uh, intersectoral um, way. Uh, in our new country program, we have a, a standalone outcome under climate change. So uh, we hope that uh, our uh, work will continue in this um, climate change and ECD, and uh, we are developing the climate change strategy in the office uh, among our program colleagues, and um, uh, we have more focus on ECD and climate change. Uh, for example, uh, when we are doing the uh, parenting programs, uh, we are also including uh, indoor air quality and air pollution topics for parents have to prevent children from air pollution and um, working with the Ministry of Education also to integrate uh, climate change contents in ECE curriculum. Yes, that's uh, overall about it. And uh, you can find uh, the resources uh, of the, uh, our interventions in Mongolia. Thank you. Thank you, Ulzi. Oh, so wonderful for you to hear about your work there with our next secretariat and UNICEF's work in Mongolia. Uh, what I, we will do is open up uh, the open conversation segment of this uh, webinar, which is the last segment. This will run for 15 minutes. And uh, we would like to would like to introduce you to our expert panelists. Uh, Ling Tang, who's the director of programs for environmental health with Vital Strategies, a leading nonprofit that works with governments to strengthen their public health systems. She is responsible for developing and managing programs on air pollution and environmental health in Asia. Uh, very critical since Asia Pacific region is known to be, I think, one of the highest, uh, or rather, the region which has the highest air pollution rates in the world. 
Ang Ser Dang, who's a lead advisor on early childhood development with Save the Children US. She's a senior expert on early childhood, having worked in this field for over 15 years. And I can say from a personal point of view is that she actually introduced me to our next secretariat, to the entire idea about how early childhood development to sex or climate change. And so I'm more than grateful to Sarah for this introduction, because since then we've had a wonderful relationship with our next secretariat, particularly in the Asia Pacific region. Um, so a question for Lynn. You've heard from the countries today on the intersection between early childhood development and climate change. And, there, and uh, perhaps there's so much more to do. In fact, if you ask me, when we talk about issues and climate change, uh, we hardly talk about early childhood development. And this is something, like I said, uh, I, I've just learned so much more about in the last one and a half years or so, working with Sarah Peck and uh, others in our next secretary, Evelyn and uh, others through the scoping study. So why do you think we need to invest in data and how can early childhood development and climate change sector work together more, given we know that it's so significant in terms of the risks involved, hazards and risks involved. If I can turn to you for a five minute intervention on this, that would be great. Thank you, Rajiv. That's a great question. Um, so it's quite ironic when you say that, uh, you know, uh, ECD is not really recognized in, in climate change because we all know that young children, especially very young children, are the most vulnerable to environmental and climate hazards as their bodies and brains are still developing. So <clears throat> at Vital Strategies, and I'm sure at many of these other organizations, data, research, and evidence are vitally important to show critical stakeholders, such as policymakers, decision makers, and even the general public, um, to help them understand what the threats from the environment and changing climate are uh, and, and how it affects the children. At Vital Strategies, we are supporting cities and countries who are interested in assembling local and global data and measuring and analyzing the links between the climate, the environment, and children's health outcomes, including things like pneumonia, childhood cancer, preterm birth, death. You know, the list is quite infinite. We believe that although individual stories are very important, like we heard a lot of stories from the presenters today about mothers, um, about um, parents who are not aware, these stories are vitally important, these images, these videos. However, data is also very, very important in telling a different kind of story from a more robust and holistic population level. And in particular, um, we feel like using data and data visualizations or really just charts have uh, an immense power to illustrate the links between the climate and health, such as between increased temperatures uh, and mortality rates, or say increased rainfall and dengue fever. Um, so we actually have developed a program that can help countries, and we've developed a guide as well um, that can help countries to want to embark on this challenge of using data and evidence to present a story to policymakers so that they um, focus on interventions that make sense. And, and not only do um, data and indicators help you to assess where you are currently in terms of your level of threat and risk, but over time, you can also track whether you are making improvements based on the interventions that you're introducing. So I'm not sure if um, Peggy or the organizers have included a link to the technical guide that we have on setting up a data and indication and indicator system for children's environmental health. And when I say children's environmental health, um, it includes climate change because the climate is part of the environment. Uh, but if she hasn't included it, um, I'm happy to email a link over um, to our technical guide or have a conversation with anyone who's willing to learn more. Um, so that's all I have for now, Rajiv, unless you have a follow-up question. Um, I think it will be great to share that technical guide because we are also, just to let you know, 
<clears throat> Lynn, is uh, in Save the Children, we are trying to dig deeper into a portfolio of the Green Climate Fund on climate change and health. Uh, noting particularly that, uh, for example, climate finance mechanisms hardly have a portfolio on uh, uh, which talks to the intersection of climate change and health. So it's a very, very minimum portfolio of funds. Uh, and we are through two countries, uh, Indonesia and uh, Laopedia, uh, submitting proposals and concept notes. And we are also looking at children as a significant cohort, noting exactly the issues you have talked about right now. So that uh, that is something positive to hear from you and will give us an impetus to sort of kind of uh, advocate for this issue more strongly with uh, climate finance mechanisms like the Green Climate Fund and others as well. So if there are any questions from uh, participants, what you can do instead is just put it on the chat and we can have uh, uh, Lynn responding to those uh, in the chat itself. So well, uh, I'll hand it over to Sarah uh, to let to ask to allow us to understand how can investments in early childhood development help build resilience against climate change and move us towards achieving the SDGs, especially when you consider that you know children, women, indigenous peoples they are sort of very invisible to lot of in in lot of policy discourses and uh, financial mechanisms etc over to you sarah thank you rajiv and i'm so glad that we're able to do this together um, um Rajiv has been just, I just wanted to start by saying Rajiv has just been one person who's been able to guide us through all of the climate change uh, programming. Uh, and it's been, it's just wonderful to be able to work together on climate change and ECD. So um, as we all know, uh, very young children are one of the groups that's most affected by, by climate change. This has been uh, something that we've been bringing aware, awareness to of over the last few years. Um, most people tend to assume that young children are just naturally re resilient, but in ECD, we know it's not that simple. Young children are sensitive to shocks and especially to the ways that these shocks impact their caregivers and their, the way that then it impacts their feeling of uh, safety and security. But they don't respond to shocks in the same way that adults do, and especially when they're babies. And research has shown that uh, children's exposure to adversity has a significant impact on their learning and development and their lifelong uh, well-being. They need to feel safe and secure, and this sense of safety and security is threatened by, by climate change. So investments in ECD can help to build resilience against climate change through the provision of high-quality and integrated ECCD services that support caregivers, reduce risk factors, and protect young children from adversity. Um, and help to ensure young children have this foundation of safety and security that they need in order to then be able to learn uh, and develop. So at Save the Children, we've been supporting ARNEC with ECCD and climate change and environmental health since the beginning uh, in, in 2019. And our focus at Save the Children and our support uh, to ARNEC for the last few years has been to work with the ECCD community in the region to raise awareness on the impact of climate change on very young children so that we can adapt our programming accordingly to mitigate its impact. This is something that every sector needs to do in order to be uh, prepared to absorb shocks. The, the investment that we've made in ECCD uh, so far from us and from others who've been working in this field, just even in terms of our time and in terms of our projects and um, uh, in terms of the different collaborations that we've been working on, um, has helped us to draw attention on the impact of climate change and environmental degradation on, on very young children. We now have um, 
videos and studies and webinars and government commitments. They're all available on the RNEC website. And we've been able to put these together and, and even bring uh, about conferences to raise the visibility on the need to ensure that young children's needs and are prioritized in the context of, of climate change. And we're seeing a shift. I mean, a few years ago, we had to search very hard to find people working in this field. And now we're hearing about more and more examples coming up and people being able to speak very confidently about this. Uh, we, we can feel the sense of community that we're creating. Um, and I feel that we're making a difference in terms of helping people realize that young children are critical in the context of climate change. But what's been really important has been really coming together and being able to do this together because by, by coming together, I think we've, we've had a much stronger voice um, so now that we've brought this attention to the nexus of climate and ECCD, um, we, the, the RNET community, really need to be thoughtful about how we direct our attention and investments in ECCD to help us achieve the SDGs. So we need, for example, to dig deeper in terms of understanding risks, uh, and these are going to be very different depending on whether you live uh, in an uh, on an island, in the mountains, in forests, in cities, if you're from an indigenous community, it, it's not one type of risk, it's a, it's a lot of different factors. So rather than having one approach, it's really having a, an understanding of how to approach and being able to understand these risks. And then giving space for solutions and adaptive thinking. And these really can only come from those who are directly impacted by these specific issues equipping individuals and communities with the knowledge and skills to develop solutions, and then putting them at the center of program uh, design and decision-making implementation and evaluation is going to be critical to ensure that ideas uh, are and, and uh, issues are addressed in a timely, relevant, and feasible manner. We also need to be able to use RNEC to be able to share these solutions and build on each other's ideas and try them in different contexts and, and again, have that common voice that we've been creating over the last few years. So it's going to be essential that we work together to increase funding for ECCD in, in the context of, of the climate crisis. Reggie, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a wonderful uh, uh, brief by you. And yes, indeed, what was there two years back and what is now, is a lot different. There's a lot more visibility on early childhood development and climate change. In fact, within Save the Children itself. And of course, beyond. And uh, we're so very grateful to the core team, including you, uh, Evelyn, of course, uh, Peck, earlier uh, Roy, uh, we had another Save the Children colleague with us who's now moved back to Save the Children UK. All of you have been instrumental, instrumental behind this, as are your partners in Plan International, UNICEF, UNESCO, and others who are part of the SARNIC Secretariat Growth. So with that, uh, if you have any questions uh, for both uh, Lynn and Sarah, just put it on the chat, and they can answer uh, on the chat itself because we are running a bit out of time and would like to therefore hand it over to Evelyn who's our next executive director for her final comments and to close out this fantastic webinar. With due apologies, Evelyn, we were running short of time and so it is over to you so you can have a bit more time if you want. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Um, it's really been a, an informative and engaging session today. And thank you for um, excellently moderating um, today's um, session. It um, actually underscores the importance of uh, working you know, together and really joining forces at the country and regional level to address the impact of climate and environmental crisis on young children and how ECD is an effective um, pathway to do that. So I'd like to take this um, opportunity to convey our appreciation to all our keynote speakers for their inspiring remarks 
the Honorable Minister from um, Samoa and Joan Lombardi from Georgetown Uni University. Both are actually our ECD uh, champions. Thanks to all our country uh, presenters, not just for your presentations today, but more importantly for leading the uh, micro research studies in your respective um, countries and uh, um, sharing the findings and recommendations, which will hopefully feed into the ECD policy and um, programming. INEC will share the final reports from uh, this the micro studies and we'll really make this available to all our uh, members. Thanks to our experts, Sarah Dang and Lin Tang for uh, your insights and suggestions on how we can um, strengthen ECD and um, its you know, um, interlinkage with um, the climate in terms of research, data, and practice. Um, save the children, you know, our appreciation goes to you as you have been our partner since the beginning, you know, when we started working on this initiative, you know, two years back as um, Rajiv and Rajiv and um, Sarah have uh, mentioned. As usual, thanks to Sheldon, our chair of the board of directors for setting, you know, the stage of this webinar with his um, opening um, remarks. To all our um, secretariat um, staff, Peggy for all the preparations, um, Joel and Siva, for helping and then supporting the coordination of the whole uh, webinar. Most importantly, thank you to our um, participants who joined us today. We are very happy that you're able to join us throughout this early celebration of Earth Day with the team um, Invest in Our Planet, a very timely um, team. We hope that you are inspired by today's um, session to join us in our journey to make change on the ECD climate intersection on the need to put young children at the center of climate um, actions and, um, this, and, and this course. Now is the time to invest in early childhood development policies and programs to promote climate resilience of young children, families, and communities, as you have been highlighting in today's webinar. Their future is at stake. Protecting the, young, the youngest children is a fundamental part of the climate crisis response. Once again, thank you to all our uh, participants for joining. Before you leave, we request you to complete a short evaluation of today's webinar. Um, Joel, if you can flash the um, code. All right, um, please use the link in the chat box or the QR code as you see now uh, on the screen. It will only take you a minute, um, but your um, feedback will really be valuable as we design our future webinars. Again, thank you to all our um, speakers, you know, Rajiv, our moderator, and all our participants. Thank you so much and have, you know, a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sheldon, and all the great speakers who spoke today, Sarah, Lynn, and others. It was wonderful moderating. At the end of the day, also thank Peck with deep gratitude to her for coordinating with me. And of course, Joel for behind the scene activities, which were very critical to ensure that this ran well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Peck or Joel, can you put the um, evaluation link in the chat box? Thanks, everyone.